This might very well be the biggest patch in the history of the Warhammer trilogy, not just in terms of overall length on a web page, but also the sheer scope of the changes and general mechanics. And frankly, it needed to be. We've been waiting a while for this, and the general sentiment is that Warhammer 3 isn't where it needs to be right now. So hopefully that will begin changing with this right here. It's really long though, so instead of going through it line by line and giving my thoughts and impressions informally with everything on the page, we're gonna try to condense it somewhat and make it a little bit easier to digest. But of course, I'm still gonna share my opinion on how things are shaken out and there's a lot to talk about, so video will still end up being decently long. Kind of did a basic overview of the patch already, but there are a ton of really important changes fleshed out and described here that never made it into that document they released a few weeks back, so this is not going to be a rehash. There are lots of new things to discuss, but do remember I have not played it yet. We don't get early access to patches, so I'm working off with the notes say, not my own experience yet. Here's what to expect on a surface level from the patch today before you boot up Warhammer 3. Crash fixes and performance optimizations, of course. A major overhaul to Core Realms of Chaos mechanics and Bellicor's Gift at the end. Thanks to the bugged Sunashi Tech interaction and impact collision changes that will hopefully make Sunashi Chariots actually usable now. Supply lines update properly after disbanding Lords. Hallelujah! Daniel the Demon Prince is getting some big time buffs. Unit responsiveness and charge reflection are being addressed. Balance updates for most factions including some separated MP and single-player balancing and price changes, Arnheim and Battle for Itza maps added to Domination, and major updates to the Domination multiplayer mode, including larger starting armies and an update to supply mechanics. So, let's tackle the Realms of Chaos campaign first, because that's going to be number one on most people's priority list. And the general idea here is to make the experience feel less rigid and inflexible, giving players more choice in terms of progression, and making the race feel less like a chore. You are now rewarded for winning a survival battle, improving control, growth, corruption, and income faction-wide for 10 turns. And those bonuses are rather large and conducive to empire building, so there will be at least some encouragement to get those survival battles done in each realm of chaos. Greater demon legendary lords will no longer be impacted by their own realm in terms of negative traits, the overall debuff for all those traits have been reduced by 50%, and those traits will be removed upon taking each Gatekeeper's soul. Combine that with protection chain buildings now preventing rifts from spawning in that province, and some of the more annoying elements of the campaign are certainly being addressed. When it comes to Bellicor the Dark Master, we talked about how it's rather illogical for factions that hate Chaos to trust Zinch or any kind of demonic pact and bind him to their service, so you can now, instead of recruiting him as a general, banish him back to the warp, which will give you a massive permanent bonus across all provinces. Again, control, growth, and income will get juiced up, alongside a plus 3 hero cap, plus 14 hero and lord recruitment rank, and more winds of magic to work with as well. Unit responsiveness has of course been a hot button issue, and if the patch notes are to be believed, they should be able to wheel, turn, move, and dodge just like units in Warhammer 2. That seems to include the obnoxious stuff like the infamous Tosa Shuffle, where your ranged troops prefer to twerk, duggy, whip, and nene for their Instagram accounts rather than, you know, firing their weapons. Charge Reflection now works properly, and you must brace to activate it rather than countercharge yourself, which is good, because we were back to a Karth patch essentially, where countercharging cab and monsters with halberds was objectively a better play than standing still and bracing to receive their mass. Made no sense whatsoever, good to see that get addressed, and there have been some important developments on the mass and impact damage side of things as well. So as you guys well know, charges from massive units like Stonehorns and Armored Cav have been somewhat underwhelming on the DPS side of things. You'll see tons of models go flying, sure, but their HP bar won't necessarily move very much. Apparently there was an issue where defending units would use the attacker's mass, rather than their own mass for impact damage calculations. And what that meant was, if, say, peasants were charged by a big monster, they were being treated like that massive monster in terms of their own mass. And that meant there was no variance between the two units' masses, leading to a situation where impact damage was very underwhelming. Instead of it being a big variance between the two, 
ended up being none whatsoever. When two massive things collide, the impact damage is lessened. When there's a big variance, impact damage is higher. So what we should see here now is bigger variance in mass between the charger and the chargee, more impact damage dealt, and that should be a buff for monstrous cavalry, knights, and single entity monsters. Haven't seen how that works in practice, but that is how it should work on paper. On that same note, Slanesh is not getting any unit buffs this patch, none whatsoever, but all these changes I just mentioned might turn their absolutely useless chariots into units that are actually worth using, because they will correctly be applying impact calculations on the charge. We'll have to wait and see on that front, but Hellflayers and Secret Chariots are super cool units, and right now they're almost entirely useless. So I am very much looking forward to giving them a shot, and hopefully actually getting some kills with them. Now, obviously, Daniel the Demon Prince was an incredibly hype reveal, and the blueprint is there as an awesome feature and campaign, but his implementation left a little something, something to be desired. He's been a big time weakling, let's not get it twisted. His Gifts of Chaos, item selection, and even his base stats are pretty terrible, and actually quite a bit worse than items and skill trees for normal legendary lords. Thankfully, that is changing, big time. And even though his start position is still absolute ass and extremely unpleasant in Norska, he's going to be a lot more effective on the battlefield and feel more like a big dick demon prince should. His baseline stats have been massively improved, and the offerings to both Chaos and Divided and specific gods have been reworked with some super nice bonuses once you get far enough down their tree, like 20% extra catch to your punishment for Nurgle or 25% extra movement range for Quorn. But that's really just a taste. The main course is, it's almost half the patch notes are dedicated solely to Daniel. So you can go through those on your own time. It's just a lot of buffs to his items and improvements across the board, really. I'll let you read all the specific stat changes to his items and blessings on your own time, but his campaign is going to be a much less underwhelming experience with patch 1.1. And I think for a lot of people, he will be the first new playthrough on this patch. Now, there still seem to be some people who think that whatever CA initially puts in the game on day one, that that needs to be the baseline now and forever, and nothing should ever be nerfed or go below that line in a strategy game, which totally makes sense, considering we all know CA is infallible and absolutely never, ever, ever makes mistakes or balances poorly, right? Well, sure enough, they made big overhauls to Magic and Warhammer 3, rebalancing every spell in the game, but guess what? They forgot about Pendulum. You know, that super balanced wind spell that's been instantly one-shotting infantry units and making many of them completely unviable. So things were obviously not correct with the PP, considering they forgot to even rebalance it. And Penumbral Pendulum, well, its damage has been essentially cut in half. Yay. Okay, let's go on to the balance changes for specific factions. And you'll notice as we go through these, that some of these changes are multiplayer only and related to price where recruitment cost is naturally a bigger factor, which is good. The Bird Boys in Blue of the Zinj Confederation are getting quite a few changes here. Exalted Lords of Change are getting access to Greater Arcane Conduit, something they should have always had. And when it comes to barriers, the only thing currently being touched is Recharge Delay. So that overshield for each unit will block as much damage as it always has, but the recharge time has doubled from 15 to 30 seconds base. I believe Kairos can still improve that delay army-wide in campaign, but I'm not sure that affects in multiplayer, and obviously, in terms of balance, this means the barrier will be a little bit less effective once that first overshield has dropped. They'll need to be out of combat for essentially twice as long. Cycle charging will still be very powerful with Zinj, of course, but you'll have to be a bit more tactical and time-aware of how long your units have been out of combat before that shield starts recharging. The Forsaken of Zinch are losing their 40% spell resist. I'm not sure I fully agree with that. I think 10 or 15% would have been just fine for a bit of added flavor and a bit of extra oomph in terms of defensive stats, but Barrier is still amazing at blocking spell damage, so hardly the end of the world for them. They were too tanky and resistant to spells, for a unit that's meant to be essentially a DPS focus class cannon against low armor enemy infantry. The Exalted Flamer is getting buffed with 50% more ammo 
and a 66% increase to range, but it's also getting a price increase from 1100 to 1300 in multiplayer only, which I don't think is really necessary. Exalted Flamers have been trash since launch. The buff will certainly help them, but that cost increase, which is a bit exorbitant, kind of nullifies those improvements somewhat. And I would have probably preferred to see its performance with maybe only a 50 gold increase instead of 200, which feels maybe a bit heavy handed. For the Ogre Kingdoms, naturally there are some Iron Blaster and Gorger changes. CA themselves have said in this patch that they envisioned the Iron Blaster as a powerful shotgun platform, devastating at closer ranges rather than artillery that can snipe single entities from across the map. So the spread of their projectiles has been doubled and they've had a slight decrease in damage, but they're still going to hit like a Mack truck, particularly when you're not all the way at max range. So now Greater Demons aren't going to get three shot from across the map, but it will still be a devastating unit against Cav, Infantry, or Single Entities, still very survivable as an armored single entity itself that has great mobility, especially for an artillery piece, and when positioned down the length of enemy formations, firing in, it will deal a crap ton of damage still. And in fact, the spread might benefit it in that role as well, because now instead of having a very tight cluster that overkills models, it will spread out more and do a better job of spreading that damage out, hitting more stuff at a single time. So it actually might be a slight buff in particular scenarios as well. Now, it did go from 1400 to 1750 gold in multiplayer only. Will still be a powerful unit, but certainly going to be less oppressive. On the Gorger side of things, go figure, they were never intended to beat elite bonus versus large monsters with frontal charges. So now they have less AP and their entity count was reduced from 16 to 12. So less HP means they won't feel quite so tanky in the grind. And I think that's a really good change because it basically shows like, hey, they're not supposed to be incredibly resilient and survivable, but they will last for a while because of their unbreakable, they're squishy, they're glass cannons, they'll hit hard against all infantry types, but they won't be going head on into melee against bonus first large cav and winning. There you go. The Cathay balance changes are pretty underwhelming and hands off, honestly. Kind of seems like CA is taking a wait and see approach with them. I would have liked to have seen bigger buffs to their Skyfleet units and to Harmony, but it is correct to say that this is a faction that thrives in land battles and suffers a bit more in domination mode where they can't make use of their mechanics or stable formations quite as much. So the changes to larger starting armies in domination that we'll cover at the end of this video will certainly make them more viable here. Personally, I don't love their roster right now. I don't think it's quite as fun or flavorful as I originally envisioned and that will only get addressed through free LC and DLC. But once they get a few more fantasy type units and their Monkey King reinforcements, they'll be a lot more entertaining on the battle side, and I think that will do them a world of good. For Kislev, Kossars, Streltsy, and Zargard, some of their higher mass, more armored infantry, will now accelerate faster from a standstill, which should help them dodge spells and reposition quicker. And I've been noticing that some of the repositioning problems are really kind of exacerbated with Kislev, so hopefully that will be a big improvement for how responsive they all feel. The Light War Sleds will have their armor reduced from 70 to 50, production of 20, and their multiplayer price increase from 950 to 1100. That's multiplayer only in terms of the price increase, and both those are great changes that shouldn't have a noticeable effect on their performance in campaign. They were overperforming in multiplayer, they're still going to be really good in campaign against factions like Korn, Slanesh specifically, and yeah, they're still going to be good in multiplayer now, even with that price increase, but Light War Slide's 70 armor is maybe a bit much for them too. Little Grom is getting a damage buff. Elemental Ice Bear will have its very low melee defense of 20, buffed by 50% to 30 now, and its cost reduced by 200 in multiplayer, so we should be seeing quite a bit more Ice Bear in battles which is fine by me. I think it's a really cool unit. On the Nurgle side, Kugath has 50% more ammo now, goes from around 22 to 35 ammunition, and heals Nurglings more effectively, which is nice because he's kind of felt a bit underpowered, as have other elements of the roster, honestly, and those are also getting buffed too. Nurgle is only getting buffs here, 
more ammo and speed for plague bears with big reductions in their price, and more ammo and reduced cost for plague drones as well. Nurgle has the most comprehensive pricing changes of any faction in this patch. Exalted Plague Bearers cost 150 less now, so you should be able to build noticeably larger armies with the Plague Father, even if you focus more on the elite side of their roster. The ammo increases will make them reasonably better in campaign, a lot better in battle in general, and it's a huge increase to Kugas damage potential, going from 22 to 35 volleys. He can do a lot with 13 more shots per battle base, so good improvements all around. For the Rot Father, Sinesh and Korn are not really getting too much here, other than better impact damage on their chariots. Again, he has kind of taken a wait and see approach for them, seeing how chariots work in general, how cab works. After this patch, we'll probably have a better idea of where things are shaping up for both the Blood God and the Dark Prince, but I wouldn't mind seeing some price reductions for Minotaurs and Skull Crushers on the Cornate side, but it does look like we'll have to wait for the next patch. And Domination is getting some big changes too. Two new maps, Arnheim and Battle for Itza. You'll recognize those from Warhammer 2, but I imagine they'll be reworked somewhat in Warhammer 3. Damage-based income is no longer a thing, so farming an opponent will not get you better supply, and that supply trickle is being increased, which paired with the increases to base income, starting supplies, and a larger main army budget will make for bigger battles that are closer to what you might see in land battles, which a lot of people were asking for. Can't say exactly how that will change domination until I try it for myself, but on paper, I think these are some decent changes and should hopefully improve the viewer experience as well. And of course, Mod Workshop and Support is a gigantic deal, and it's going live with this update. I expect to see some glorious things out of our modding community. So those are the big elements of the patch that stood out to me. So let's talk about what I feel is missing from this update. The biggest disappointments I have with this patch so far are no fix for flying units, dry humping their opponents into submission when trying to land, but at least they have said they're aware of it and are actively working to fix it. So that's good, I guess. I don't know when that will happen, but one day, hopefully. I see no fix for the army movement bug where you have 100% movement range, your turn just came up, you haven't been affected by any zine shenanigans at all, and yet you cannot move your army. It's just grayed out. Can't move your lord. I've had that happen at least once in every single one of my campaigns since I've had the game, really, and it's pretty unpleasant. It's a really bad bug. Uh, I'm not sure how widespread it is, so maybe that's why it hasn't been talked about yet. I've seen a couple people talk about that on the forums, but other than that, I don't know if you guys have had that same issue, but it's really bad, especially if you're on Legendary that can straight up ruin a campaign. I see no changes to make the SSAO when in Shadow or Snow Maps not look like hot garbage. It really does look terrible right now, and it needs to be improved because there are too many maps where it makes the units themselves just look awful in an otherwise gorgeous game. And the cinematics, the close-ups of the units, it's part of what makes this game special, Part of what makes my content interesting so yeah I, I don't like having to zoom in and see really terrible shadows and shading on my otherwise cool looking units not cool there's really no excuse for it to be worse even worse in warhammer 3 than it was in warhammer 2 especially because of how often it was reported back then and has been reported now i see no changes to in battle flickering low fps on certain battle maps particularly Cathay ones or low FPS problems in general around Kislev and Glutport on the campaign map. Perhaps those are being addressed in the optimization portion of this patch, but they were not listed, so I'm not getting my hopes up on that front. And those things I just talked about were reported to CA well before launch, so either they don't know how to fix them yet or other things are being prioritized. I'd argue all the things I just listed are pretty important, and I'd rather they not remain unaddressed for years at a time. I was hardly expecting all these things to change in a single patch, and if everything listed in these patch notes is indeed actually addressed and fixed up in patch 1.1, then it's going to be a massive improvement to the game. Will it be enough to get tens of thousands of players back? Probably not, but I do expect to see a bit of a resurgence here, especially due to mods, and if they can strike while the iron's hot, get us that long-awaited roadmap, 
the blood pack and maybe the first round of free LC as a token of goodwill, then I think we can be right back on track. Player numbers will almost certainly not eclipse the 100,000 concurrent mark again until Immortal Empires, and as I've said previously, that is a landing CA will have to nail, but despite the rocky launch and people's annoyance with the Realms of Chaos experience, there are some great improvements here, and the game is only going to get better from this point forward. Overall, relatively happy with what I've seen for patch 1.1, and hopefully it will improve the experience for you guys as well. Hope this was helpful, and I'll see you all in the next video. Any pride? Signing out for now. Have a good one, guys.